Let's hear it for Paul Hoffman. Paul? So in grade school, I was known as the science and math guy. If my friends wanted to know what a black hole was, they turned to me. If someone tossed out a number, say 153, well, I could tell them something special about it. I mean, 153, it's the smallest number that's the sum of the cube of its digits. When one of my friend's moms tried to make pineapple jello and it didn't congeal, it was all this soup, she turned to me for an explanation. And I could tell her that it was the protolytic enzymes in the pineapple that were denaturing the gelatin proteins, <laughs> and that's why it didn't coagulate. I was Mr. Rational, and I believed that science could explain everything. Now, I got into science and math kind of by default. My father was a literature professor at the New School, just a few blocks from here, and he read three novels a day. He was a speed reader. But much more than that, he had a photographic memory for everything he read. He could tell you, quote, all of Shakespeare, Nabokov, James Joyce, Thomas Pynchon. I mean, he must have been a great teacher, but this was really intimidating when I was a kid. I mean, when we read a book like Charlotte's Web, he had some unexpected insight into the pig's motivation. I mean, I was jealous. I hated this. I stopped reading fiction. You know, I wanted to excel at something. My dad was horrible at math, so I decided math, that's what I'm going to do. Also, science and chess. He wasn't too hot at those, those either. So when I entered Harvard in 1974, I decided I was going to be a physicist. But there was only one problem, and that was my freshman roommate, Jomshed. Jomshed, when he was still in high school, was part of a team of physicists who had discovered a subatomic particle. <laughs> so, you know, my high school resume, chess club. <laughs> His resume, fundamental subnuclear particle of nature. So I thought, you know, there just isn't room in physics for Jomshed and me. You know, during summers at Harvard, Jomshed would go back to the particle accelerator. That's what you're supposed to do at Harvard. You spend summers, you know, smashing atoms together, interning at the New York Times, going to South Africa and vaccinating poor children, stuff like that. You know, prestigious things that would help you in your future career. But I had no idea what my career was going to be. And these elite jobs paid nothing, and I needed money. So I came here to New York, and I got the highest paying job I possibly could, and that was being a doorman on Park Avenue <laughs> on the Upper East Side. And it was great because I lived with my dad that summer, and it was the first time ever. I mean, I'm a child of divorce. I'd only seen him on weekends, so I thought this was great. You know, my bohemian dad in his West Village pad, I'll get to know him, it was wonderful. But even the first day, I found myself being competitive with him. We went for a walk in Washington Square Park, and all the drug dealers came up to him and not me. You know, he was 40 years older than me and had better hipster credentials. So, you know, this swanky building on, on Park Avenue I worked, it was a large building. It had a large staff. I mean, there were doormen, there were elevator operators, there were freight elevator operators. They were all Yugoslavian, okay? They were really, really nice to all the people that were in the building. I mean, I'd never seen people be so nice. It was great. And I was filling in for one as... as um, he went on vacation. But the job was a bit of bait and switch because I was actually at the door only about an hour a day and the rest of the time I was in the elevator. And what that meant, here I am, I'm in a uniform, you had to wear white gloves, this was a ridiculous building, and I had to make myself vanish. I, had to, I was told, wedge yourself into the corner of the elevator, never speak to anyone unless they spoke to you first, know what floor they went to so you didn't even have to ask them. Of course they spoke to me because I stood out, a college kid among Yugoslavians and you know, a Harvard kid at that. So down in the basement of this building was a, um, there was a locker room where we changed from our street clothes into our uniforms. And above the lockers was this museum of embarrassing objects that the doorman had fished out of the garbage of all the residents. And <laughs> each one had the person's name on it and their apartment <laughs> number, okay? So the very first one was some kind of restraining order against a guy in the building. The next was a copy of Playgirl, and it said Jeffrey Burns, apartment 4F. And then there was this huge, huge dildo, Irina Birch, Penthouse East. And I was amused by all this, but I was also horrified. I mean, friends of mine lived in doorman buildings. Did they know that these guys were, like, mocking them behind their backs? And the mocking in this building, it didn't stop with this museum of shame. 
I mean, whenever a beautiful, sharply attired woman walked by the building, and the doorman would say in a really nice, cheerful, friendly way, he would say, Pichka. And often the woman would smile back or wave. And later I learned that Pichka was Yugoslavian for whore. <laughs> now, the duplicity in the building extended to much more than the doorman. It extended to the residents. One night I had a 16-hour shift. I mean, that was 16 hours, most of them in the elevator. It's tiring. About midnight, suddenly the elevator is summoned on the 10th floor, and I go up. And the doors open, and there's no one there, but there's a tray with a glass of wine and a plate with two lobster tails that this woman obviously had her chef prepare. Now, you might think it's nice. She knew I was working a double shift. I was hungry. But I knew that she had a gentleman call her, and her husband was out of town. So this meal was like hush money. I mean, this was a summer I lost my innocence. I mean, I realized that, you know, you just couldn't, you couldn't take anything at all at face value. I had a lot of time in the elevator to ponder alternative careers to physics. <laughs> and for about a month, I decided I was going to be an ACLU lawyer. I was going to argue freedom of, speech courses, freedom of speech cases before the Supreme Court. I had fond memories of the ACLU because years ago, my father had involved them when I was kicked out of first grade. I mean, I was a militant six-year-old atheist, and I would skip the words under God when I said the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> so one evening, one evening, I came back to my dad's apartment. It was the evening before I was going to take my LSATs. He's not there. I'm pacing around. I'm a little nervous about the test. I walk in his office, and I see next to his typewriter a manuscript. And on it, it's, the manuscript is called, it's like a book manuscript, it's called How Not to Raise Your Child to Be a Lawyer. <laughs> and it's the same paper that his typewriter used, it's the same type font. I start to read it. I mean, it says, don't be a lawyer, and you know, you don't want your kid to do this. My dad walks in at that moment, he gets really mad at me, you know, he starts yelling at me, what are you doing in my office? I was always in his office, I always used this typewriter, he knew that. And I started saying, what the hell is this? You know I'm taking my LSATs tomorrow, what is this? He said, you shouldn't have looked at that. I don't know what that is. And we had this real argument. It was really a one-sided argument, though, because I'm yelling, screaming, getting hysterical, and he would just answer in measured tones. And that made me, drove me even crazier. And you know, I would say, you wrote it, you wrote it. He'd go, no, 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 I didn't write it. And then finally he goes, well, maybe I wrote it. Go, what the fuck does that mean? I mean, you either wrote it or you didn't write it. And he goes, well, I wrote it, but I was ghostwriting it for this famous female attorney that doesn't think anyone should follow her into the legal profession. You know, I was a hired gun. That's not how I feel. You should become a lawyer because you know you're really good at arguing. That's what she said. Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, I would realize that my dad was lying about this, that he was, you know, didn't want me to be a lawyer, but that's not how I felt at the time. I mean, I, you know, this was my dad. I, I, I held him up on a pedestal, and if he said the dog ate my homework, I thought, you know, the dog really did eat his homework. So the next day, I'm there taking my law boards, and suddenly I realize, you know, this is this, too much of a coincidence. This manuscript appears the night before I'm going to do this. You know, he's trying to derail this. He doesn't want me to do this. And I started thinking as the test began, and I started thinking of playing through my mind all the convoluted stories my dad had ever told me, that, and I outwardly had accepted all of them until that moment I knew they weren't true. My dad had told me about his great athletic successes, that when he was at the University of Wisconsin, he was the national collegiate boxing champion. One of my college roommates, who I told this to, looked this up in the record book and couldn't find my dad's name. And I had confronted my dad once, and he said, it was the saddest moment of my life. It was a great miscarriage of justice. The referee got really befuddled. He raised the other guy's hand for a nanosecond, then pulled it down. He realized what he had done, but it couldn't be undone. You know, the mistake was in the record books. <laughs> and so many of these stories involved manuscripts. I played serious tournament chess in junior high school. I would stay with them on weekends and do this. It was in the middle of an important championship. I came home, and there was this weird yellowing manuscript from the 1930s from a psychoanalytic paper of a Freudian interpretation of chess, that you play chess if you have an unresolved Oedipal complex. And I started to read it, and I saw, my dad had even highlighted, it said, the goal of chess is to murder the father, and that was like in yellow. <laughs> and I confronted him then too about this, and he said, you shouldn't have read that, it's not for you, I didn't mark it up. You know, I had found a yellow magic marker across the room. 
Once my dad had taken an entire year off from his work to write the great American novel. All his friends, his professor friends, thought he could do this. After all, he had committed every great novel to memory. Why couldn't he synthesize them and do something better? <laughs> so six months into this, I was a kid then, and I went to visit him, and he looked horrible. He looked the worst that I had ever seen. I said, what's the matter, Dad? And he said, someone has stolen my novel. He said, someone broke in the apartment. I kept the manuscript on top of my typewriter in the typewriter case and stolen it. We spent the whole weekend going around to pawn shops in the East and West Village, and we tacked up reward notices in like laundromats and coffee shops. And here I am in the middle of my SATs, LSATs, and I have this horrible realization that my dad destroyed the manuscript, that it must have not been going well, and he made up this ridiculous theft story to cover that up. My dad was a brilliant professor, but that wasn't enough for him. He had to be the very best. He had to be the best boxer. He had to be, you know, the best writer. Maybe even the stories he told himself, maybe he believed them because he was so caught up in the world of fiction. And at the moment, the, the proctor said, pencils down, time up. And I looked down with horror at my answer sheet. It was a multiple choice test, and I had only answered two questions out of, <laughs> out of like hundreds. And, you know, I was, I was used to getting... Um, perfect scores on standard tests, and I was just, I, I was dazed, I got up, I was like angry, I was, I was sad, and I like walked out of the place, and a few moments later, I was suddenly like eerily calm, and I realized I was free, I was free that I didn't have to be the very best, I realized then that, you know, I wanted to be a writer, I always wanted to be a writer, and I could do it without competing with him, and I found great joy in life, not being a scientist, but writing about scientists. And then I started reading all the books again, all the books I should have read when I was a kid. I mean, Catcher in the Rye, you know, Lord of the Flies. And I gotta tell you, they're pretty good.